Thank you, Pastor Brian, and thank you, Paul, for that amazing song. It is great to be here. Hallelujah. And I want to begin by affirming 100% and confirming that God our Father is a good, good Father. Amen. Amen. Not only do I want to say that he's a good, good father, but he is a tender father. He's a holy father. He's a terrific father. He's a providing father. But he's also a loving father. And this morning, he wants to invite us, including me, to go into his inner glory. In other words... He wants to invite us to enter into that perpetual love affair, meaning permanent. That Jesus, our older brother, Hebrews chapter 2, and our father enjoy it together. And he wants us to enjoy that perpetual love affair without interruption or distraction. And therefore, I want to remind you that in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and he came out of that water in the Jordan River, there was a voice that Jesus heard. He said, that's my boy. Oh, that's my boy. In whom I am well pleased. And I want to tell you this morning, beloved, those that are here, those that are outside, those that are watching through the computer, However they're going to connect with us today, that God the Father wants to affirm you today. He wants to approve you. That's why the number one issue in this country is not the economy, it's not ISIS. It's the broken family that leads to crime. We have 2.6 million people behind bars in America. We have 11.7 people that go through the jail system every year. We have 20 million people on paper, parole, probation. We have an issue in America that father is absentee. And we cannot become a father unless we get to know our father. And God the Father wants to be your father. Stop fighting him today. As a way of testimony, I want to tell you today that Jesus is not first in my life. He's not. Nor is he at the center of my life either. Because you see, this faith that we have in Jesus does not go against logic, reason, nor reality. Therefore, if I say to you that, that, that he's first in my life, actually his life that I'm living now through him in the Holy Spirit, if I said that he's first, that means that somebody else is second or third or maybe fourth. If I said to you that he's at the center, that means that somebody's on the left or on the right or on the bottom or on top. And we have to echo the words of the Apostle Paul who used to be a serial killer. He, was, he used to be a terrorist. And he said in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, the last verse there at 23, he says that Jesus is all in all. In other words, he's not first, he's not at the center, he's all in all. I want to tell you before I continue about these two guys that I believe they used to attend uh, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. Uh, they were fighting over is God black or is God white. And they went to work together and they got into a little argument no, God is black, no, God is white. And they got to work barely, and the, the shift was over, so they got into the car again, and they went home, or they attempted to go home, and the fight became more intensified, and they were arguing even more, and oh, God is black, God is white. And they were not looking forward, you see, because we fight over stupid stuff, don't we? So looking forward, they were not looking forward, and they hit this post. And they both got killed instantly. But because they were, they, they came to, or they attended Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, they made it to heaven, you see. So <laughs> they, 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 uh, they got to heaven, and there was Peter waiting 
at the gate. Peter met them both at the gate. So they said, hey, Peter, tell me now, is God black or is God white? They said, oh, guys, you are here right now forever in heaven. I'm going to call on God. You're going to find out, you know, who he is and how he looks like. So they were still arguing right there. You're going to see he's black. You're going to see he's white. And finally, they hear these big steps, you know. Boom. Boom. Oh, you're going to see he's black. No, you're going to see he's he's white. And finally, God walks in and says, buenos dias, amigos. (laughs) So he, he's not, he's not black. He's not white. He's Cuban. He's Cuban. (laughs) In Cuba. I remember April 6, 1988, I was released from prison early, and I was the first ex-convict ever to attend Wheaton College who earned a BA degree and a master's, was ordained as well as a minister then. And I look back because, you know, I came from Cuba as a refugee, and I made it to the top. I had four cars, I had hair, Uh, (laughs) I, I was good looking then, you know, I was a great dancer. I had everything that I thought you would accomplish on the American dream, you know? And, um, and I thought that I, that I was God. If there was a God, I was, you see, my mom was a witch. She was a medium. All these demons went through her. So I grew up in that kind of a setting. Yeah, she was Catholic. Yeah, she went to church twice a year. But she really did not know who Jesus was. And, and, and I look back and I said to myself, man, what did just happen to me? I went to prison. Oh, by the way, anybody can make it to prison. <laughs> Matter of fact, there are more people in prison in our churches than in all the prisons and jails put together in America. But anyway, I look back and I said something like this. I will always be an ex-convict, but by the grace of God, I will never be an inmate again. In the back of my book, of my story, I write, I could have been dead so many times. Maybe some of you can relate to that. I always spent more money than I had. I was always in over my head, and I was always involved in too many things at one time. Everything I did was with me in mind. In other words, I believe in the human trinity. Me, myself, and I. (laughs) You see, when I left jail, prison, I said, I will always be an ex-convict, but I will but I will never be an inmate again because I was going to be partaking from the grace of God. I went to Wheaton. I began to experience some success. And at the beginning, yes, I was partaking from that grace. But then I began to trust in me more and more and more. And I began to look to me for success. And I was leaning and partaking less and less from the grace of God. You see, we can now mess with the glory of God. And for 20 years, I was in ministry, and one day I get a phone call that my wife had just gotten involved in a car crash. More about that in a few minutes. But right now, I want to play baseball with you. I'm from Cuba. So I need a picture. And this is a baseball bat. I need a pitcher. Can you pitch? Can you pitch? That's okay. You stand right there here. <laughs> you and Jesus can, can do that. Now, we're going to pretend, okay? Okay, so don't throw the ball, okay? The boy's in there. <laughs> now, uh, can you catch? Who can, you, can, can you catch? Come over here. Come over here. Come over here. And we're going to put you right here. So you're going to be right here. Okay? Okay, you stay right over here. Okay? Now we're going to pretend, okay? <laughs> Don't throw the ball because they're a little bit concerned they're going to hit the ball and break one of those lights or something, okay? <laughs> so, no, 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 no. You need to put this style. You need to be able to know how to pitch. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. 
They stand right here. You need to put down, and, you know, and that's it, on your knees, exactly. Okay, listen. I don't have a glove for everybody, but I'd like you to put your glove on right now. Can you show me your glove right now? Thank you. Now, listen. In baseball, you have to catch the ball, and you have to retain the ball in the glove. If you drop the ball, what happens? The guy is what? Safe. Ah, you got it. You got it. Okay, so I'm going to hit you three baseballs now, three balls. And you must catch them, catch them, and retain those balls, okay? Are we ready? Okay, so okay, so now pretend, okay? Are you there? Okay. Come on now, throw me the first ball. Bang! Did you catch it? Okay, here it is. This is what you caught. In the back of my other book, I wrote, When you pray, hallowed be thy name, be Things happen. Could you say that with me? Come on, let's say it. When you pray, hallowed be thy name, big things happen. In other words, it doesn't happen for you. So you see, prayer will not change things. Prayer will change us. Prayer has to become more important than the water that we drink, the food that we eat and the air that we breathe. Prayer is not one thing we do as Christians, it's what we do. Second ball that you're gonna throw, okay? Throw me a curve ball, a good one. Okay, wait, 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 yeah, come on. Are you ready? Okay, okay, come on now. Bang! Did you catch it? Second ball that I just hit you. Praying radically to love Radically. Radically means, radical means to go back to our roots. You see, I cannot tell you that I love you or you tell me that you love me unless I am committed to pray for you. Jesus, his life on the earth was a life of what? Of prayer. He never did anything without consulting with his father first, getting the approval, the affirmation, and the green light to do what the father desired he was obedient he obeyed without delay he did not for a moment hesitate you see every time that we hesitate in our obedience you know what happens we always forfeit the blessing if you and i are to be like christ and we must correct i mean that is our duty that's our aim is to be like like jesus right well here it is to be like Christ is to pray like Christ. So, could we say that together? Praying radically to love radically. You got it. You are good. Okay, number three now. Throw me a screwball, okay? Come on now. Bang! No, that was a ground ball. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give this man a, a big hand. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're a good catcher. You a, this is uh, Johnny Bench right, right, right here. Thank you very much. Now, let me tell you the third truth that you just caught. And this is the most important one, and this was, and this was why I wrote the book, Radical Prayer. God our Father is a good father. He's not on the line. He's not a paramedic. There's a picture on the screen right now of a vehicle. Inside that vehicle is my wife, Barbara. You see, this is now for men. Every time that we men are not cultivating and developing a radical prayer life, you know what we're doing? We are leaving our wives and our families unprotected. Although I was involved in ministry for 20 years, and I was busy, and sometimes we are busy doing nothing, you see. I, I, I was busy, uh, I was not protecting my family because I was depending more on self than on the grace of God. And the Father, because he loves me so much, he had to awaken me. And he's going to use the people that you say and that I say that we love to begin to awaken you. So he used this crash. I didn't call this an, an accident. 
There's no accidents. We believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. And he's not going to let you go. So what happened, I got a phone call that my wife was hit by another lady, the car till. She was trapped in that car, lost three fingers. She was saved from meeting Jesus face to face by about a second. And when I got there, the chief of police says to me, Manny, you cannot go any further. I said, well, but I want to help my wife. Really? Now? You want to help your wife now? She said, well, you cannot do anything, but you can do one thing. She said, you can pray. And I have to come clean with you guys. And I came clean in my book. And the first chapter of the book, I call myself a hypocrite. Because the moment that he said, you can pray, I feel convicted because I've been quenching the Holy Spirit. I have not been hallowing the name of my father. I've been thinking more about me than my father. And then he showed me what it meant to hallow the name. But I was not, not yet awakened. I went to a conference for pastors, 2,000 of them. And the theme was about prayer. I was not going to go because I wanted to be a good husband and take care of my wife's hand, you see. But my wife heard that the thing was about prayer. So she bought the ticket, registered me, and sent me. <laughs> and Cuba is German. When a German wife tells you to do it, you do it. <laughs> Castro and Hitler. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I went. And wonderful speakers, I found out at that conference that 80% of evangelical pastors in America don't possess a personal prayer life. I found out that most pastors do not even take time to pray with their spouses. Also find out that most Christian couples don't pray together. But this is what really hit me. We talked about prayer for almost four days, but we never took the time to pray. In other words, I mean, I mean, in other words, if you don't live it, you don't believe it. And then I came home distraught. And I wanted to spend some time with my father so he could evaluate me now for 20 years. So I went into this cabin for three days, no cell phone, no computer. And I wanted God, the Father, to speak to me through Jesus Christ, through his word, and the Holy Spirit to give me the grade from the Father of my 20 years. So I thought I might get a C or a C minus. Within the first hour I got my grade, it was an F minus. I even picture my father with his thumb and his index finger on his nose because he could not even stand the smell of my prayer life which stunk. He took me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 32 and he reminded me that his big guy, Moses, did not have a duo. In other words, God fired Moses and hired Joshua to take his place. In other words, he told me, you are not indispensable. I call you. I can fire you right now. I threw myself at his mercy. And the reason that he fired Moses was because Moses did not Hallow his name. What does that mean? Hallow means to adore. It means to revere. It means to value and to cherish. It means to worship. It means to glorify. It means to respect. It means not to bring a father shame. That's the opposite of hallowing. And then he took me to Luke 11. So I want you to, to have, if you have your Bibles with you, please open it now to Luke 11. And I want to study that with you this morning. That's what my book is really all about. And I'm going to study it with you in a very, prov in a very unique and a very provocative way, which I am praying right now that you will be convicted, which means awakening in the Greek, that you will be drawn to the Father, that you will have a desire that, that, that Jesus will become the only object of your affection. 
that the father will become the only object of your provision that you will fall in love with this great father who sent Jesus to be crushed on the cross for you and I that his blood may purchase you which he did and I want you to once again to tell you that this father is a good father so here in Luke 11 we see verse 1 that Jesus is praying I mean, Jesus is 100% God, 100% human, and he's praying. That really caught my attention. And I said, man, if Jesus is praying, how about me? And this is not the first time that he's praying. He always prayed, and now he's toward the end of his life on the earth. He's now walking almost to Calvary, actually walking to Gethsemane, and from Gethsemane to Calvary, and the disciples are watching you see guys in life most things are not taught they are caught and they are watching his master they are master and they say hey Jesus we want to pray like that there was something about that prayer me that was different that attracted them that caught their attention and they asked him Jesus will you teach us so now and you need to pay attention because Jesus he himself is going to teach us to pray. In Luke 11, especially the first four verses, we see who we pray to. We see why we pray. We see what we pray. Then we're going to see in verses 8 through 12 how we pray. And we're going to see in verse 13 the great hope that we have in our Father. So here we go. Verse 1. He's asked to teach them to pray. So now, if you are a disciple of Christ, he's about to teach you. Because you see, many of us really don't pray because perhaps you don't know how to pray. Or perhaps you give up too quickly. Or, or, or perhaps you, you, you never seen verse 2. But well, we're going to see it now. Look what he says. He says, so he said to them, to us. When you pray, say, our Father, what in heaven. Look at that first phrase. Look at the clash. Our Father. Jesus is saying, he's my Father. Yes, he's my Father. But he wants to be your Father too. And he sent me on this mission that I will perish because he wants to adopt you so you won't perish. You see? He, because he loves you, you see, he loves you. So he says, this, this father wants to take care of all your needs, of all your common needs, of all your mundane needs. He's a good father, I know. I've been with him hey, from the beginning, before the beginning. I have no beginning. I've been with him the whole time. I know him well. He's the other brother. Let me introduce you to him. Listen to me. I'm your other brother. Inclusive. Our Father who art in heaven. Look at the clash between the mundane and the common versus the holy, the majestic, and the glorious. That this Father is also our creator. He made the moon, the sky. He made everything. He made you into his image. That's the kind of God he is. Father who in heaven, hallow be thy name. Let me stop there. For many of us, we know that this is what? This is the Lord's Prayer. The other part that we find, this is in Matthew 6, correct? So we see here a very common text, very familiar text that many of us are familiar. But you see, when we are so familiar with the familiar, many times it, it becomes unfamiliar. And many of us repeat this prayer like a parakeet, but we have, we have no idea what it means. Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that you should say, okay, you want me to, to teach you? Here it is. Hallow be thy name. Hallowing my Father is his priority. In other words, I want you to pray his priority. It is not only a worship. It's not only an acclamation, which it could it could be, but in this context, 
He's saying to us, I want you to pray. Everything that you pray has to be directed. The content of your prayers is no longer me. It's no longer myself. It's no longer what I want. It's now the content of my prayer has to direct everybody, every prayer to my Father's Halloween. You see that? In other words, this is the petition. Then he says, let your kingdom come. For what? To hallow his name. Let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For what? To hallow his name. And then he makes a dramatic shift. It goes from the glorious, but also from the mundane and the common, but his glory, now the focus comes to us. So we have three petitions right there. Hallow, kingdom, will, then it comes to us. And he says, I want you to be healthy, asking for your health, asking for some food. Because you see, you want to eat some food, not so much to enjoy, but for you to be able to have the energy to hallow his name. Health. Then he says, number five, he says, forgive me. I mean, how can I pray to a holy God if I'm not forgiven? And of course, if I've been forgiven, I have to forgive others. You see, when you become a Christian, you become a debtor of grace to others. In other words, you and I have to forgive others because we have been forgiven much. And how many of us have an interruption with our Father because we, 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 we don't want to forgive somebody else? So he's there, the health. Then the hope, H-O-P-E, helping others pursue eternity because he wants you to experience life that is abundant. Life, L-I-F-E, living in freedom every day, not in fear, not in fear, but in, but in, but in love. Then he says, live not into temptation, but, but what? Deliver me from evil. In other words, he wants us to be holy. And we are holy not because we are holy. We are holy because at the cross, according to Martin Luther, there was a double exchange. You see, Jesus at the cross took my sin. I imputed my sins to Jesus, and Jesus imputed. It's a double take. You see, it's called a double imputation. Jesus imputed into me his righteousness, you see, because I'm required to be holy. So, we have the health with the food. We have the hope with the forgiveness. We have the holiness. Eliminating to temptation, but what? Let me from what? From evil, right? And I want to suggest to you guys this morning without being offensive, and please, I'm not here to be offensive. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you. It's for you to get to know this Father. Not to pray is evil. So the structure of this lost prayer is not just three plus three. Is one plus five. In other words, the five on the bottom, let your kingdom come, let your will be done, give me some food, forgive me, I don't want to be tempted, I don't want to give in, I don't want to do evil. Those five on the bottom, they serve the one time. In other words, everything that we pray, beloved, has to be prayed with the content of our prayers, has to be fueled with the word of God in order that we will hallow his name. You get that? Now he goes to a story that only appears here in this parable and in this context as well. Uh, most parables in the, in the Bible, you have to find quickly two characters. Number one, where am I in the story and where's God? Well, here, very easy to find where I am. I have a friend that comes to my house at midnight. He knocks on my door and he says, hey, can, can I stay with you? Well, by culture, I am obligated to say yes to him. So he comes in, but, and I have his room ready, but then when I go to the pantry, I don't see any food. So okay, I'll be right back. Wait right here, I'll be right back. So I go to my friend, and I knock on his door. And I've been there before, and I know where to go because this friend always provides for me. So who am I? Who are you? You are the person that goes on behalf of the neighbor to intercede on his behalf in order to get the food that he needs for him to be able to go to bed with his stomach full. But when I knock on the door, 
the guy behind the door tells me, I'm already asleep. Wow. I'm already in with my children. Wow. Go away. Now, in America, we don't want to hear that. If, if, if I'm going to suggest to you this morning, which I am actually, that the guy behind the door who just told me to go to sleep, uh, to go away, who is sleeping, I'm going to suggest to you this morning that that guy behind that door is representing God the Father. He is. He is. And, and in this country, in, in the church in America, we don't want to hear that. We want to go to a God that's going to give us what we want, when we want it, and for ourselves. In other words, we want to be part of the me church. But that's not what happens here. He's saying, go away. But look at verse 8. Look at the answer. And verse 8 is one of the most important verses of this of this scripture right here. It says that the friend got up, not because he was his friend, but because of what? Of his persistence. In other words, in the Greek, if I shameless, shameless. In other words, that I am being inappropriate. He's my father. He's my daddy. I could be with him inappropriate. I could persist with him. You see, he likes it when I do. So I'm not going to go back with my hands empty, not so much because it's going to bring shame to me. But I cannot go back because if I go back with my hands empty, it's going to bring shame to my father. You see, and at the heart of prayer, I told you earlier in verse 2, hallow be thy name. When you pray it, big things happen. And what happens? Because I'm Persisting, I know that you're in there. I'm not going to go anywhere until you come out and you give me what I ask because I'm not asking you for me. You see, Daddy, I'm not asking you for me. I'm asking you for my friend. I want to make you look good. I want to make you happy. You know I cannot go back and say that you, Daddy, although you have it, you didn't give it to me. I don't want it for me. I want it for him. You see what I'm saying? We have to pray with that kind of intensity. An expectation. We, we need to pray with the assurance that our Father is listening to you, that His eyes are fixed on you, you see. And when we do, the Bible said that He opened the door. Not only did He got what He asked, but He got so much more. Then we see verses 9 and 10. And He's about to interpret for us what He means by persistence. He says, Ask and you shall receive. He says, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. And then in verse 10, he goes back to verse 2 and he becomes inclusive against I said, everyone. Everyone of who? Every one of the children that have been adopted now. Everyone who asks will receive. Everyone that Six will find everyone that not the door will be open. You see, in the Greek, there are three verses right there, and they are infinite. In other words, ask, seek, and knock have no ending in this text. Therefore, you and I have to be knocking, have to be seeking, have to be asking until God opens the door. It is when you persist. It is when you persevere with joy. That for the joy that was before me, hallelujah, I endure the cross. Hallelujah. <laughs> See what I'm saying? In America, we are, we are, we are, we are wimps. We are wimps. We give up too fast. Jesus never gave up on the cross. He hung in there. So you and I don't have to hang in there no more. That is our calling, to persevere with joy. And then what he says, and now he goes to give us an amazing illustration. Verses 11 and 12. He says, and now he's going to make another connection with verse 2, with the Father. Now he's going to talk to us as fathers. Mm -mm 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 -mm. He says, what father, if your son or your daughter goes to you and asks you for a piece of Cuban bread with toasted, with jelly and butter, will you give him 
a stone? Will you do that, sir? Will you give your daughter or your son a stone if he or she asks you for a piece of Cuban bread, even though you don't like the, the, the Cuban bread? <laughs> will, you, will, you, will you do that? No. Okay, how about if he asks you for a piece of fish with butter on top, broil, fresh, I don't like Michigan? And, and, and will you give him a, a, a serpent? Will you do that, sir? Will you do that, sir? You want to do that? Okay. How about if, if, if he or she asks you, sir, for some scrambled eggs with chorizo <laughs> and Swiss cheese, last tomatoes, and lots of mushrooms? So, so I'm going to go to your house today, so make sure that you have all the ingredients. <laughs> okay? I'm going to go for lunch, okay? So will you give him, will you give him a scorpion? Oh. Look at verse 13. Let's read it together. If you, who is you here? You see, guys, the Word of God is applicable to all of us. This book is the living Word of God. This book is the all authority of God. This book is 100% reliable. This book is 100% sufficient. This book is 100% satisfying. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> if you then, my main point today is this. God the Father is a good father, not a panamanic. I've been teaching you this morning through God's word what a radical prayer looks like and what it produces. It produces results from you being responsible to hallow his name. And then he wants to bless you. He, he wants to bless you. He wants to bless you and help you to enjoy the same benefits that Jesus, our older brother, enjoys with the Father because our Father is not a respected person. He's not. He's a good Father. He will bless you as much as he has blessed Jesus. And he's already made all the payment for you. He's already paid in full with his blood on the cross. He is, guys, if you then being evil, connecting it with verse 4. If you being evil know how to give good gift to your children, how much more? I'm just about to introduce you now to the theology of the how much more. Jesus is the superstore. There's no ending. It is unlimited. I'm not preaching tonight or this morning any prosperity here. No, 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 no. I'm teaching tonight or this morning. I'm teaching today that God the Father wants to love you lavishly. That he wants to give you his own fathom peace. That he wants to give you his unspeakable joy. He wants you to become a hallower of his name. He wants you to go to his word. He wants you to feast in. He wants you to, to dig deeper. He wants you to soak in his word. He wants you to pray back to him his word. He wants you to experience his presence today 100%. How much more will your heavenly Father, going back again to verse 2, going back to verse 9, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask it. Could we do me a favor? Could, could we read this together? Come on. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gift to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let me close with this. There's some confusion in the church. It is true that the father turned his face away on the three hours of darkness when Christ became sin, although he was without sin. When Christ became a child molester. Mm. When Christ became a killer and he became a thief. And a liar, because how can we tell people that all sins, past, current, and futures uh, have been paid? If he didn't make payment, he became sin, the Bible says. Now, I'm provoking a little bit. It is true 
that the father turned his face away. Not so much because of the payment that he was making, but because he was disfigured. His son was disfigured. His son was unrecognizable. His son was being abused. Um, just think about that, guys. Just think about Next time that you take communion, think about this. Christ took the full cup of wrath. So you can take today the full cup of mercies. And his mercies are new every moment. Don't you forget that. Every moment. And you see, guys, we cannot pray to a God that we're not grateful to. We, don't, we cannot demand from God. Just because we persist, he does not have to give it to you. But he wants to give it to you because he wants to delight himself in you. So it is true that he took his face away. But the Holy Spirit, he never abandoned Jesus on the cross. And here's my main point. I don't care what troubles you are now going through. Mm -hmm. What is your problem? What is your crisis right now? What is your issue? For sure, it's not bigger than the dead Jesus. For sure, it's not bigger than making payment for all the sins of the world. For sure, it's not that. For sure, it's not that. So if the Holy Spirit helped Jesus on the cross, he will help you too. You see, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit helped him. He's the counselor. He did not come, hallelujah, to pay rent. He came to own the house. In my book, I wrote six pages about the Holy Spirit from a real balanced biblical perspective. Let me close with a story. Let me give you an example of what I mean by praying the Word of God. I have five kids. I was a womanizer. Read my book. I don't know how many kids I have had out there. Because I don't know. But one for sure came out. Let me Sasha. She called me 14 years ago. I was not home, but I was, I went to pick up the mail. And my wife answered the phone. It was a young lady. She said, my name is Sasha. She was talking to my wife. My wife saw me, said, come on in, come on, come on. Get the phone, get the phone, get the phone. So I got the phone in the phone. So she says to me, is your name Manny Mel? I said, yes. Uh, did you live in Union City, New Jersey? Yes. Did you knew so-and-so? Yes. And then she tells me, I believe I am your daughter. I said, can I sit down for a moment, please? <laughs> when we were done, my wife says to me, well, is anybody else out there? <laughs> I said, Barbara, I don't know. But if there's anybody else, we're going to go on and face the music. We're going to go and face it. So I went to meet Sasha. This past March, not this March, the March before, I have a group of men that we meet every Wednesday for about three hours at my office. And we pray Malachi 4 see, that says God is going to turn the hearts of their fathers to their children and their children to their fathers. Sasha just became a Christian last March. Amen. <laughs> In the book. Guys, when we pray, hallowed be thy name, big things happen. I want this morning you to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and for you to examine yourself, take inventory as Pastor Brian comes. And that you will make business with God. Don't take his grace lightly. Don't take it for granted. He's a loving God. Remember what I told you earlier. He's inviting you to enter into the perpetual love affair Amen. that God the Father has with Jesus and he wants to have it with you.